forgot about some of the setbacks until Butch reminded me at the end. But, uh, uh, I didn't fall off the scaffolding. Uh, my helper took the cross brace off while I was still up on it. The whole thing collapsed and resulted in a, a severe concussion and a trip to Abington trauma where um, I, I should be paying the last that all this, this month. Um, but there, those, are, those are minor things. If, if we can overcome those things to create a thing of, of lasting beauty, then everything, it's all worth it. And, and I really thank Ed and Earl for, for their support throughout the process. And I'm sure at times I tested their, their patience. But, uh, I do believe which, you know, we, he mentioned the Holy Spirit was involved in the selection and, and the development and, and execution of the window because 10 years ago it would have been a different looking window and, and, and probably not as good. So um, God is good and his timing is perfect. So um, glad to be here this morning. Any, any questions? Mark, right. I think people would appreciate hearing a little, just a little bit about your work on the National Cathedral. There's you know, a couple of things you've done there. Sure. So in uh, 1986, the man who taught me, Charlie Lawrence, uh, was commissioned to do the Reformation window, which um, very interestingly featured Zwingli in one of the uh, lancets. There were, it was a three lancet window with the tracery above. And the cathedral had experience with the studio that had made other windows that he had designed and said that, you know, they're no longer welcome to fabricate your work. And you know, if you want to do the window, you're going to have to find something better than what they've done. So he asked me, he said, you know, do you think you're ready to do this? And, and of course, the exuberance of a 24-year-old or 25-year-old said, absolutely. You know, so he, uh, he, the cathedral said, well, not so fast. We want to see what the work looks like. And, and we want you to create two uh, samples of, of the actual size and scale and color and craftsmanship and all of it. Um, so we had two windows that were about three feet wide and two feet tall, and we went down to the cathedral. I was feeling very confident, and um, you know, all the lead was really, really hard to, because there's no protection glass; it has to survive the elements. And you know, it took a little bit longer to cut than I was used to, but I persevered, got it all done. Was, you know, everything was, as he said, ipsy dipsy, and we uh, drove down there. And they said, well, now you've got to hold them up in front of the window. And I'm like, well, where's the window? And yeah. looked up, and it's 82 feet tall. And, and then, OK, well, we'll go up. And, and so we went out on the walkway. And the walkway was about this wide. And the air was so stale that I was nauseous. My dad's a pilot. He taught me to fly. I'm OK with heights. But the, the stale air and looking down and seeing little Clerk of the works and Charlie on the ground saying, now hold the other one up. <laughs> so, you know, we did that about four or five times. And uh, the cathedral, the clerk of the works, you know, ran his hand over all the solder joints, looked at everything over and said, you know, you can proceed, you know, and that's about all he said. And um, two years later, we actually put the window in. And I guess it was 87, 1987, we went for the dedication of that window. And, uh, sorry? People get down the Oh, so it's, it's uh, if you stand in the children's chapel and look up, it's the middle window of the clear story. So it's in the south transept. So if the cathedral's always laid out the shape of the cross, so the, um, the south transept would be you know, the right side of the cross and it would be on the red side of the aisle. So that, that's where that is, in right in the middle. Um, but that was a formative experience, <clears throat> sorry, because um, the quality of the work they demanded was, was higher than, you know, anyone else had ever seen. And so, everything we learned from that, we, we brought forward into our current work. And, and most of the glass we do now is behind protection glass. And that is the current recommendation for even medieval glass. You, know, you want to try and protect that now and not let it hang out there in the elements. But the cathedral is out in the elements. It survived an earthquake about five years ago. It still looks, the window still looks great. Um, but a very, a very formative and very proud moment in our career. Yes? Uh, I just want to say that uh, on April 7th, uh, the church had our first opportunity to view the stained glass. The subsequent Wednesday, April the 10th, we were in the period of Lent, and it was my turn to give a message. It just so happened that my message had to be on uh, the crown of thorns. 
So I did my research, and originally I had chosen a uh, 16th century German artist who did a uh, painting at that time of Christ with the thorns and the crown. Uh, but then uh, several things happened, and uh, I was so took by this image, I exchanged that image and put this one there, and when I talked about the crown, uh, Around that same time, unfortunately, the Cathedral of Notre Dame suffered a tremendous tragedy. In my research, I found out that they had been given a relic, which was handed down to the church through the centuries. There were no more thorns that remained from the original crown of thorns of Christ. This was a representation of the uh, the, 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 is it acacia, the wood? I, I right. can't remember. Could be. Yeah, well that wood vine is what they had at Notre Dame. And while the church was in flames, one by one, volunteers passed along as one of the uh, uh, images or representations, they passed along that relic which had the crown which had the exact same, in my mind, uh, uh, twisting that these uh, vines have. And so forever in my memory, I will always remember at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, April the 10th, talking about the crown and then looking at Notre Dame and looking at a crown that was almost exactly the same that has been preserved for hundreds of years. So thanks to you. And thanks to the image, it will ever be, forever be burned in my memory. Thank you very much. Yes. Kind of more practical note: is there is there any reasonable way that this can be lit from inside in the evening, especially so that the people driving down the street can enjoy that color? That's that's a um, a good good idea. Um, I have seen uh, the building lit up at night, and, and that's when, when the glass will look um, exceptionally good. Um, there are, you know, LED spotlights and things you can put on um, that wouldn't draw a lot of energy that, that can make that make that happen. Um, and it's, it does become like you know, you're on a hill; it becomes like a beacon to the community to light that. And I think it's, you know, it would be something to look into, and, and certainly worthwhile would be. You know, the less, uh, the more efficient energy the choices have. Yes? Since Coach uh, mentioned it, that little white piece of glass, you get a Yes. So, um, you know, but in the Lord's Prayer, the line right after um, Give Us This Day, you know, that was a suggestive of the, the manna that the Israelites uh, received, you know. Just a day's work, not a, a week or a month or a year's work. So it's uh, not about storing up your treasures, but just counting on God for that daily nourishment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only going to stop doing that. I mean, and that's what makes me an artist, not a business person. Because, <laughs> oh, sure, I can go for that, but you know. It's, um, there's a point of acceptance in the project where you just have to do what needs to be done and, and not count the cost. And, and um, <coughs> even in almost all, none of my jobs sort of really count the hours unless it's a time and materials thing because it, it, it diminishes the joy I have. And, and you know, if I think I'm making less per hour than I thought I should be, it, it just diminishes the joy of working on it rather than you know. I'm not that fond of sleep, so I'd rather work on, on glass than keep the pillow compressed. So uh, I don't have the cost, really. It's, it's so um, overall, it, it seemed to take quite a while, but uh, at the end, it's sort of, um, the window's about half built, I guess, when you design it, because I work with the actual scale, and, and, and I, I'm planning everything, and, and so I know what I have to do, but then, um, there's, there's sometimes there's unfortunate things. The, the American glass that's used in the flowers and the uh, background, 
Uh, some of it fires in a kiln, so you can add painted details, and some of it opacifies and changes color and is ruined. So uh, I learned the hard way on some of those that I had to, you know, choose a different glass or choose a different method. Um, so like the, the orange, orange and uh, yellow glass, uh, that turns a pink white when you fire it. So everything I get painted with that glass had to be redone and just left to be let it be the beauty of the glass, not trying to impose my will on it. So it's a um, it's always a learning process of what the material will allow and what it takes away. <laughs> and then sometimes you break a piece or your studio help, you know, breaks a piece. But um, my daughter Alyssa in the back actually did um, who painted a lot of the roses, so I'd like to thank her for her hard work. She's an architecture student at uh, Rensselaer in New York and um, started in physics and now switched to architecture and her, I think that's going to reward her creative abilities much better than physics would. So the roses to me are both um, celebratory and born of suffering, so the, uh, the placement of them is, is kind of a link to the uh, creating world below and the suffering of Christ on the cross above. So the, you know, his, his blood spilling, uh, his love for us expressed as a, a, a passion of the rose in that color is sort of the link between the, the crucifixion and the creation for me. That was, uh, roses are just deeply evolving of, or evoking of, uh, you know, love and, and beauty and, and also sacrifice. So that's my, my take. But I, I don't want to over think or explain things you know, to people. But um, you know, roses also have thorns, but they're a thing of beauty. You know, we despise the thorns, but uh, Christ accepted the thorns as part of God's plan. So. Also on the roses, uh, just practically, how do you know that the roses So you're right, they are, they are painted. Um, that glass is a German mouth-blown glass called flashed. And what that means is it's a base of clear glass with a, a layer of color on it about the thickness of two sheets of notebook paper. So what I started by doing um, is taking hydrofluoric acid uh, with a resist and, and making those areas lighter where I wanted highlights and then adding paint where I wanted the areas darker and then firing it in the, the kiln multiple times to get that, uh, that effect. So it is permanent. The, the paint is not like a, any kind of paint that we're familiar with. It's a dry um, powder. It's basically ground glass and metal oxides mixed with a binder, which could be uh, sugar water or uh, vinegar or oils, anything to bind it all together. Uh, it's applied to the glass with a brush. Um, shading is done by uh, applying a, a thicker film and then pulling out highlights with a soft brush um, and then putting it in a kiln and then firing the glass. So it's, it becomes part of the surface of the glass. How much temperature do you use to 1150 to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So when I first uh, learned that I was in a studio that had what they called a beehive kiln, it had about 24 gas jets on each side. And it would, if you wanted to fire glass, it was an all-day proposition. You had a guy that would just have to man these jets, and you'd have to turn the heat up like three jets on and on the side and let that go for about 10 minutes and add a few more jets until we, eventually you had the kiln blazing hot, and then you'd have to reverse the process and then bring the glass down very slowly. And that was to avoid thermal shock, which is what I'm afraid probably happened at Hydro Down. I think there's probably a lot of thermal shock in that stained glass. But the, um, the people in Holland came up with an idea of using infrared energy to, to create that heat in the glass. So I have a kiln uh, that has three infrared burners, and I, I just turn it on high, light it, and in nine minutes, it's at 1150 or 1200 degrees, and I shut it off, and it, in 45 minutes, I can handle the glass, because it's all constructed of heat-resistant material, and the only thing absorbing the energy is the glass. So. Uh, because of the infrared wavelength is, is different than just thermal shock, 
the glass doesn't break, it, it remains ability, the ability to cut it and everything, so it's, it's a very remarkable uh, tool. Yes? Uh, when I studied art, uh, and I studied about the medieval times, uh, I realized that in many of those cathedrals, uh, basically the windows were the primary source of light for a service, and so everything was geared toward the light temperature that would come from natural light plus however the refractory was from the glass. I know that it must have been an enormous challenge not only to deal with the outside temperature light-wise, but also on the inside, we have a combination of fluorescent, incandescent, and LED lights, all of which have different temperatures and all of which can affect the refraction coming from those glasses. So uh, kudos to the team for being able to come up with something that in the 21st century can work with the temperature of light that we have inside and yet to bring the temperature from the outside and to have the refraction come just the right way. Thank you. I, I do prefer working in daylight on the glass selection, but I will also look at, look at the glass through artificial light just to see if there's anything that, that uh, is untoward. You know, some colors really do have a big shift in the different uh, the lights. The LEDs have been a, a blessing once they moved away from that really cool blue, blue light of the initial day. Uh, that was that was hard work. <laughs> we won't have a chance to ask you when this is happening, but can you tell us a little bit about the changing colors of the glass that we were able to see? Yes, so the, the what looks like a um, pale yellow peachy kind of glass around the perimeter of the cross is actually what's called dichroic glass, and that's a, a modern uh, invention that they they put glass in the um, vacuum furnace and spin it and then they, they have metal in a, a crucible that they hit with an electron beam and it disperses the metal across the surface of the glass. Um, so a flash glass has a layer of the sheet, the thickness of two sheets of notebook paper. This layer of metal is, is measured in millions of an inch. I mean it's really, really thin. Um, so that when you're looking through at one angle, you'll have one wavelength of color, but as you shift to a um, a different angle, you have the hypotenuse, which is a whole different color. And then at night, like in a reflective situation, it'll be a, a, a color yet again. So um, to me, part of the real interest is early in the morning here, and I'm so glad the surf started at 9 instead of 10, because the reflections on the sidewall were, were very interesting to me. And I think um, in January or February, it's going to be even more so. I think you're going to have some really neat uh, light shows in here. Yes. The stars. The stars were uh, reminiscent of, of the existing building. I wanted to incorporate um, that shape, but, but essentially um, we kind of had creation at the, at the beginning and, and everything moving up from there. So the, the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and so the stars were representative of the, of the heavens and, and space and, and um, you know, the unknown. Okay, so that's also a flash glass. The base glass is uh, pale yellow, and then they put a thick coating of uh, blue on top of that. So we used uh, resist and, and uh, a sand, sandblasting technique to remove that blue glass to create the star. So, um, my experience has shown me that that particular glass, when you etch it, is prone to explode in the kiln. So I, I didn't want to add any paint and details to that, but I just um, used the etching to create those stars. And I, and I think it's very effective because if you if were to create lead lines out of each star, you'd have a very heavy looking um, composition. And, and part of the um, part of the appeal of the larger pieces of glass, someone was saying uh, um, in medieval times they, the pieces were much smaller, and that was because of the, the extraordinary amount of energy required to make the glass in the first place. You didn't throw anything away. And um, there's a beauty in that, but there's, there's also a considerable expense. And, and it, it attains a certain look. So when I saw this window, I kind of envisioned it as a, um, you know, with 10 years of looking through it, you kind of expect to still see a little bit through it. And I, I wanted the idea of a portal rather than a, a painting, you know, so that I, I like the transparency of the German glass and the, the way that it shifts the color and texture. 
and uh, so larger pieces uh, appeal to me. Yes. Uh, speaking of preserving, uh, which parts have been preserved from the original glass that's been in this church? Ah, yes. So on the border, uh, borders are broken up by a little band of pale amber. Uh, so each of those rectangles around the perimeter is from the old church. And also in the flowers, there's, there's two pieces from the old church that were appropriate. Yes. So my, my vision of Arden is the second panel up on the left right next to the right tangential to the border about halfway up the, the glass. It's, it's stylized because, again, that glass would have pacified by being fired at. But um, her brother, the architect, the man who um, known my <clears throat> stained glass teacher, uh, like her, he had given her the plan so she had maintained it for all of her life. So. Yes? I, I love that because it's it's kind of um, it, it's the unexpected and, and it's it, it takes what what I've done and makes kind of a new whole, whole new piece of art and, and it's really it's, it's God's light coming through that's doing that you know as much as I've agonized over the window to me that's the bonus is, is to, to me it's, it's I see that as a, a new creation just like all of you saw the window as a new creation when I put it in. So I, I love those reflections, and I, I hope to come back in uh, like January and see what they do. You know, as the sun gets higher, it'll put the reflections lower on the wall. But um, I'm thinking in January we should have a really nice painting across the upper part there. And can I have another question? I'm in school that on glass is a super cool fluid. So I'm just wondering how long it will be before we see visible sagging. <laughs> <laughs> At, at the risk of offending any scientists, um, I, I've also heard that, and, and uh, the, the, the people that have, have they notice that the glass is thicker, ostensibly at the bottom. So hand blown glass is thinner in this. They, they they blow a bubble and then they stretch it into a cylinder. They let the cylinder cool. They cut the ends off and slice it and put it back in the furnace and let it flatten. That's, that's how this kind of glass is made. Um, so there's thick, ed thick edges near the ends of the cylinder and thin, ed thin glass in the, in the center. So depending on how I cut that up, you know, there will be a thick piece and a thin piece, but um, I don't believe in any way that the thin piece is going to make the th thick part thicker or vice versa. But it's, it, glass doesn't move until it's about 900 degrees, and short of a fire, it will never see that temperature in here. Uh, but I have seen that. I've also seen pictures of scaffolding outside windows that they attribute, you know, as cracks in glass or something. So, you know, sometimes the the intellectuals get it wrong in the field. But um, I, I have heard it's a super cold liquid. Uh, it is notch sensitive, so. Uh, unlike stone that requires like diamond and a lot of energy to cut, uh, a simple score with a carbide wheel or um, you know can cause it to break. So there are some properties about it that make it fascinating and frustrating to work with, but um, it will you, it, nothing will change in our lifetimes or our grandchildren's lifetimes. Also, uh, because I uh, videotape the service every week and. As I go throughout the year, when I videotape someone who's at the dais, uh, the temperature of their skin, the skin tone, is a combination of the ambient light as well as whatever light is coming from above, and then whatever light bounces from uh, in back of them. One thing I've noticed about the uh, properties of the stained glass, it has a warm coolness. And so it is a nice, cool, natural tone that it gives to the speaker when they're actually giving their message, it's a, it's a nice warmth, a, a nice earthliness that, that appears naturally when I videotape. That's nice to hear. It's, it's, uh, 
something I'll, I'll credit uh, good luck to because I, I didn't really think about that. You know, it, it is nice uh, byproduct of using all the colors. We tend to get just as I mentioned with the, the Crayola factory um, by using a full range of color. I guess that's what what, what happens. Um, I have done windows that are very blue, and it can create a very kind of almost pulsing quality to the, the room that is a little bit unnerving, you know, when you first enter. Um, so I think I think you're right. I think the balance of colors probably contributes to that uh, quality of light. And certainly, I would think with now not having all that raw light behind, the, the pictures are probably looking better. I would, I would imagine. We put stained glass in behind the sculpture of the Guadalupe. The sculpture looked far better, you know, when you weren't looking at that raw light behind it. So I imagine even which looks better these days, right? Yeah, yeah. The pastors are very grateful you make us look better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like a printing press and someone with a like a rake will come along and, and rake it a few times and then they'll roll through these rollers like a, a sheet of cookie dough being extruded and it, it just imparts all that blending and swirl and it's the kind of thing that you, you can't possibly do any other way except you know Tiffany would use that technique to make his glass you know he would envision a sunset or a sunrise and he would just tell his glass makers you know make sunrise glass and they would work till they got a piece that he liked um, this is much the same way. It's, it's, each piece is unique, so I, I had like three cases of it that I went through piece by piece to see which, which had the right colors and blends and movements and darkness. And, um, it was just a joy to work with. I mean, it's a, it's a material that um, they're not making anymore, so it's, um, it's scarce, but it's, I have a lot of it and enjoy using it. it, and it, it to me, it, it's very an earthly kind of... Um, just symbolizes everything of Earth. It's kind of earthy colored, it's rich, it's textured, uh, it's blended, you know, it's, it's a nice contrast to the purity of the German glass.
You're supposed to heckle me. You were gonna heckle me, he said. Sorry. <laughs> all of them. Okay. Yeah. Sherry and Mark are switching all of them all together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Sherry's quite fun. There's something. Yes. Yes, um, that's, what, that's why I really like to uh, put a lot of time and effort into the initial drawing because that's kind of a blueprint, just like a, an architect would create for a builder. Um, but within that, then, then you, you have, um, as soon as you transition from the drawing and the, and the artwork to the actual glass selection, uh, the glass will often inspire me to make changes to the, to the sketch. And, and that's, that's something I, I love to have that happen because um, each of the pieces of glass is, is made by craftsmen that, that love the material and, and they, they try and put a lot into it. Uh, the glass, <coughs> the deep red, with the, the swirls that we had custom made in Germany, and it's just phenomenal to look at. And if it, any other uh, artist would be able to buy that glass, it was made you know, for this project. So, um, I had an idea, but then I'm inspired by the materials. And, by the site visits and feedback I got from Earl and Ed, you know, that made some changes and uh, <laughs> 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 well I guess that is the risk of working with something every day and, and you know you, you become attuned to the the beauty and, and then you're looking for real nuance and, and things that most people don't know. And I guess that's why Glitch's comment about not letting it become a piece in the background really resonated with me this morning because uh, hopefully you can see it each week afresh and look at the slightly different lighting, understand like in the rain or at night it has a totally different look to you that I don't get to see. Um, it's no longer the studio, but um, the man who taught me was very hard on himself and would just be full of self-critique and, and no artist is exempt from that. And, uh, there's, but you know, he created beautiful work and, and hopefully uh, following his footsteps I've, I've done the same. So uh, a lot of things I obsess about may not even be noticeable and it's not even worth 
trying to explain what those are, but the, the greater message is that it's, it's your window to enjoy and, and to see things in it that you, you know, find meaning. Yes? Can you describe it as Dangerous? It's it's smaller than I wanted, but it was all I could afford when I built it. Uh, it's maybe twice the size of the chancel, something like that. Um, but that's not not altogether uh, unusual. Like the stained glass was really kind of an itinerant um, trade, like in the medieval times. You know, there was no like big studio in one place. They would move from cathedral to cathedral and work on windows. So. Um, all the essentials don't take up all that much room. Um, you know, I'm happy to have you know a very efficient kiln that doesn't take up a lot of room, and uh, glass cutter is a little bigger than a sharpie marker. So it's you know, it, um, you know, with the bare basics, you can you can do quite a bit. And I went to Carnegie Mellon University, and, and um, but before I could go, I had to get a portfolio together, and I, I had taken the art classes in high school, so I went to Bucks. Two years, and that's where I learned uh, stained glass from the man who did the cathedral window. So God has a plan uh, that's always better than ours. But um, I went back to Carnegie, and, and their wood shop was also very small. They didn't have a, uh, a table saw, and they didn't have a shaper, they didn't have a lot of things that the Bucks had. I thought, how is it that a school that charges this much money doesn't have as good facilities as Bucks? And, and I was dumb enough to ask the professor about it, and he said, well, look, if you can make what you need to make in a simple shop, then you don't need all the other stuff. Kind of makes sense. And so that's sort of been the, um, the unofficial reason of why I stayed in such a small shop. I, I would, I'd love to have them spread out, but it, it also focuses the mind and the energy when you have a small shop. That, uh, everything is, your wood is always in front of you. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's got a nice uh, north light window, which I use. Mm -hmm. So that part's good. Um, but it's, it's really compact, and, and uh, you were sworn to secrecy by you, were going to say. <laughs> so, so, where are you on the stables? Do you think of what you sell? I think the funniest part is that you stand there talking, you don't get used to going to all the doors. The wall can open the door, and then why are you so? Or Matthew. But he never closes it, he always leaves it open. So in the wintertime, I think they could eat those. Uh, when was the first time you saw it all together? Here. Here? Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? Uh, I was very pleased with it. Um, I, we, we spent one, one whole day just putting metal in. Like, and so at the end of the day, you know, it looked like we did absolutely nothing. You know, but then the next day, we brought the glass, and then Everybody's like, wow, how'd you get done so fast? You know, it's like, well, because all the prep work was done. Um, but my, my studio is, is small. I mean, you know, large studio, you have trouble visualizing that entire work as a, as a whole uh, concept. But there's so much that, that, you know, you've got, in the late afternoon, you get reflected light that bounces off the window. There's no way for me to, you know, know that in my shop. So I was here for the first time, and we all went together, and, and uh, you know, Butch came in toward the end, and, and he seemed visibly moved, and I was, you know, delighted for that result. Well. Uh, along with the translucency of the glass itself, at night, because it's not totally uh, see-through, at night, what happens is that the light from inside bounces off the glass and comes back. So even at night, there's a different texture from a video standpoint that it that it emits to the room so that when we have an evening service uh, and you have nothing but the interior lights and the interior lights bounce off the opacity now some of it's passing through but the majority is bouncing back and when it bounces back it gives a wonderful again texture uh, to the evening service and a whole different presentation because all the all the deep red German glass that's fantastic in the day it looks like black at night, you know, with lights on in here. But all the American glass will light up with the surface color, and then all the acrylic glass around the cross will turn into that shift color. 
Yes. That, so that was perfect for Good Friday because Good Friday was so late. Um, we started in the sunlight and it went to darkness through the service. Oh, and so wow. as that happened, the yellow turned to purple and the red to black on Good Friday. It was amazing. It was wow. truly amazing. So, that's a uh, that's a desired uh, outcome, but it's really hard to replicate in the shop. You you, you, know, you mentioned uh, what was, was I surprised or was I aware? Um, a lot of times I would spend evenings in the in the shop working on the mechanics of it, and I would see that whole different presentation that you know you guys never got to see during your tape time visits. And but I, all I do is wonder like what it will look like at night with services going on. So I'm really glad to hear that on Friday at the end of the evening. Yeah, Monday, okay. Thursday as well, but those. Just Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We got okay. we got a double header. Those guys. Nice. <laughs> yes. As a community, we always enjoy watching squirrels. Okay. And I'm not yet seeing squirrels.
I'd like to I'd like to think of it as the Holy Spirit working in me. The man who taught me was immensely talented, but uh, extremely um, full of unbelief until very very at the end of his life. Um, and I always thought, you know, how interesting it was that God could use, you know, an atheist to create windows for the cathedrals and the churches and, and inspire millions of people and, and not be touched by the, the message that he's conveying. And he would not just put a symbol in the middle of a field of blue or, you know, he would have an incredible color palette going, which I, I admired. His work was so different than, than the average church. And his, his symbolism was very abstract. And uh, that was so abstract, in fact, that a lot of times in the scholarship put the windows in upside down. And he, would, he would jump up and down and be furious. And the scholar would just shrug and say, it looks the same to me either way. You know, so, but there's, there's times when an artist goes to great lengths to, to put something there that, that is subtle, um, that, that works with the flow of the art around it. And, and I, I like to be. I like to have some things evident but not overwhelming, and I like to uh, leave it to people to invest enough energy in it that they they can see things that I either intended or, or uh, even missed. You know, and, and when you when you paint a scene that's completely resolved, it, it becomes an illuminated painting, and you can appreciate the scene, you can appreciate the window, um, but essentially you've come to grasp what the whole concept is about rather quickly. And with a window like this, you know, there's there's gaps and there's opportunities to see things that are meaning to you that might not have been to me. Uh, if, if I just made geometric lines, I wouldn't be able to stand here and say, I think you should be able to see something organic out of those straight lines. But um, this, this design has a lot of organic qualities to it, and I think that ties us back to nature, and that makes us think of the creator. And, I like the idea of people investing enough that they, they discern things that, that hopefully I thought of, but if I didn't, um, it's, it's the Holy Spirit putting them there. Uh, I'm thinking about your personal health and the health in the studio, and I know that um, for you, as for any artist, when you have to work with combustible materials, and you have to work with extreme heat, and you also have to work with uh, things that have chemical reactions as well as metal halides and so forth, halides. Uh, what does it do to your lungs? What does it do to your skin? What does it do to your eyes? Uh, and how do you protect yourself in that environment? Um, exactly. Um, when they say that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, um, I've seen artists paint in full respirators. Um, the man who taught me used to lick his brushes as he would paint. That's a definite no-no because the, the glass paint has lead in it as a flux to bind into the glass. Uh, apparently it tastes very sweet and that's why animals will often lick it and that's apparently why he licked it. He did wind up with lead poisoning, but uh, by God's design you can get rid of lead poisoning by uh, over time, your body will, will remove the metal if you, if you limit the exposure. Um, eating, washing, eating, smoking, which I don't do, uh, when your hands are full of lead, is it no But there's some common sense things I do. Like I, I, I cover cuts, I try to keep my hands clean, I um, don't stand directly over the iron and, and suck in the fumes. But um, there's been a good long number of stained glass artists that have lived a long time and, and not died of something that killed in the shop, so um, I, I am lucky I, I had a, a bad a accident in, in uh, January and I had a bad fall the prior year, so um, I'm not sure either of those things would have been mitigated. I, I guess whatever sacrifice I make, I think it's still worthy endeavor, is, is what it comes down to, and, and to try and be so prophylactic that I limit my exposure to zero, which just would mean the creativity would, I think, drop also. Often, um, sometimes I'll take the actual piece and, and just 
put it through the process and make sure it works. But you're right, with the stars, I did do sample pieces.